It's now my pleasure to welcome our first speaker today, uh, Jeff Mulgan, who has, comes to us from London. He is the chief executive of Nesta, which is the United Kingdom's, and I would say much more broadly than that, one of the world's leading think and do tanks around innovation. He is a self-described policy geek, and importantly for our conversation today, he is the author of the forthcoming book, Big Mind on collective intelligence. Um, Jeff has asked that this be a very conversational session, so I want to just alert you to start thinking about questions. You can tweet them to CI Conference, C-I-C-O-N-F 17. Um, and in addition, we'll have roving mics following Jeff's presentation and the dialogue that we'll have together. So let me just put you on notice um, to start thinking of the hard questions we want to ask Jeff today about the ways in which we can combine human and machine intelligence to augment our groups and hopefully uh, improve our democracy. Thank you. Well, good morning and thank you. This mic is working and as is this uh, clicker. So first of all, thanks, uh, Beth, for the invitation to be here and I have the chance to spend a couple of days with lots of people I have admired and learnt a great deal from in recent years. What I'm going to do is a fairly quick overview of both some, some thoughts on collective intelligence, where it's going, one key idea, which I think is both old and new, and then a, a challenge to the field about where we collectively might go next. Um, the starting point, in a way, is kind of obvious. We see this flood of new tools, uh, Watsons, DeepMinds, Fitbit, smart homes, and so on, and a likely continual escalation in the power of artificial intelligence and machine intelligence, but a risk of a, a growing divide between that and actually the ability of our day-to-day -day systems to function. And you can see some of the problems, I think, in the strange paradox that many of the institutions which have the, the, the most expensive hardware, the best tools for thinking, still make the most foolish mistakes. Uh, and indeed, we probably need a parallel science of collective stupidity, uh, which will have lots of case studies. And this country is doing its bit in creating new case studies at the moment on why is it that very advanced institutions make really foolish decisions. And I think there are some good theoretical reasons for understanding that. And we have a, a sort of problem of technology development that so much of it is essentially predatory in motivation, whether military or commercial, sucking intelligence out of societies rather than putting it in. And our common task, as the Dean said, in a way is how to do something very different to that. Um, in my own organization, very briefly, we've done a lot of work over the last years on, on data for good, working with governments, NGOs and others on, on mapping and analyzing and so on. Um, Around this topic, we have a recently started project across Europe on personal data commons, which some of you might be interested in. We've had a lot of work on helping cities uh, use data, set up offices of data analytics, predictive algorithms, and so on. Um, a lot on the regulation of machine intelligence. How do we enable anticipatory regulation for these tools and create new kinds of institutions in national governments? A lot of work on the economics of cognition, and I strongly recommend this blog on algorithmic versus human decision making and what we can learn from some of the uh, YouTube and Facebook experiences this year in the economic balances of uh, costs of error and value of success in both algor algorithmic and human decision making. We're creating new spin-off companies like this one, which is using AI for um, recruitment to screen out uh, bias in job recruitment and we're also a commercial investor in quite a lot of AI companies. So that's kind of the, the, the background really surrounding this uh, field. Uh, and closer perhaps to Beth's interest, we've also done quite a lot on technology tools for democracy. The Descent tools, which were uh, part of the, this, um, this network around GovLab, are now in use in 15 cities in Europe, like Madrid, where uh, Madrid Decide enables citizens to propose ideas, debate, comment, in something much more like collective intelligence than classic democracy. These are still all really at city level rather than national parliaments or governments, but the tools are rapidly evolving. What I want to do today, though, is, is sort of turn the, the telescope around and really, again, start where the dean started. If we look at our most important systems, what would they look like if in five or ten years' time they really were intelligent? 
making the most of machine and human intelligence to solve problems and make the world a better place. Uh, and these are sort of some of the fields which I'm interested in. Ones like clean air in a city, uh, cancer I'll talk about, ecosystems, public health, jobs. If we start at a systems level, rather than starting from a particular technology and trying to apply it, what's the theory, what's the practice, what are the skills for doing that well? And I'm going to um, go through very quickly a bit of what is in this book, which comes out in a few months' time, which attempts a combination of theory, description, and prescription. With these three essentially uh, animating questions, how do we get the brain power of the world better, uh, better applied to the most important problems? How do we design systems of collective intelligence good at solving complex real-world problems? And how do we grow a, a discipline, an academic discipline, and a profession which is highly adept at doing this in practice? So for me, a, a very crude starting point, but one we found very useful, is to break down the elements of intelligence into different functions. And this applies to human individuals, it applies to machines, it applies to whole systems. What are their models of the world? What is the data and observation they bring into those models? How do they analyse and predict? How do they remember what's happened in the past? How do they coordinate physical systems? How do they create and how do they make judgments and how do they demonstrate wisdom? These are the things which in an individual together make up intelligence. They are highly connected together, um, even though they have some uh, separate functional elements. And at the moment, in a period of huge explosion of both machine and collective intelligence tools for all of these separately, probably the biggest trend has been around observation, obviously sensors, data of all kinds, but also citizen-generated data. This is Peta Jakarta, citizen-generated data on floods in Indonesia. We have a whole host of predictive models in London as in New York in our fire brigade now using prediction, though it didn't work two days ago, I'm afraid, of which buildings will burn down to try and lead to a more preemptive, preventive style and the big collaboration of DeepMind and London's hospitals is trying to do that for healthcare, predicting who is likely to have a, a disease in the next two years rather than uh, a purely curative system. Um, we have quite interesting uh, developments in memory. We now have a dozen what works centres whose job is to synthesise the collective memory of a field like policing. Uh, this one, say, works for police, goes through all the sort of things the police could do, shows their impact on crime, how they work, where they work, their cost, um, and if you click through that, the much more detail and implementation. It's a collective brain for an entire uh, system. And we're beginning to see better tools for judgment. This is one of our investments, which is an adaptive learning tool for, uh, for schools. Um, we don't yet have any for wisdom, but that's a question perhaps we can come on to later. Now, the premise of my talk, really the only sort of idea I want to get across, that, is that as in the individual brain... The power of thought comes from combining these different things together. I think the same is true of collective intelligence, that if you can get a system which links observations, models, analyses, memory, creativity into action and learning, you're much more likely to be able to solve the complex problems of something like cancer, uh, climate change, and so on, than if these are all run separately. And strangely, nearly all the current examples are run by different organisations on different principles with very little joining up. And then the next stage of the thesis is that within any collective intelligence system, you need a series of learning loops, an ability to adapt thought within an existing framework, where new data essentially is fed into an existing model, but also the ability, when that model doesn't work, to create new categories and models, and if that doesn't work, to create entirely new cognition systems. And when we look at companies or governments or civilizations and see them as intelligent, is the ability to have all of these working um, in, in tandem according to the nature of the challenge. So what I've been trying to do in the last year or so is, um, is look at uh, examples of collective intelligence assemblies and then try and pull out what might the lessons be for future ones. There are a lot of examples from the tech world which are semi-assemblies. So the iPod is a classic one which brought together lots of different technologies from 
uh, MP3 compression from Germany to the Sony Walkman to Napster and pull them together into something new. Google Maps, I think, is, a, is, is an even better example, um, which is, in reality, the assembly of Google Search Engine and a whole series of companies which Google bought uh, with different capabilities of um, Street View, Google Earth, scrollable maps, the open API to allow people to use it, Google Map Maker to bring in the public, all assembled in order to create something really useful, which Google on its own couldn't do. And what I'm going to quickly go through now is a few other examples of live collective intelligence assemblies, which I think are pointers to what could be possible in the future, but I'm also going to share some of their limitations and challenges. So six or seven years ago, NASA and Cisco developed this one, the Planetary Skin Institute, with the aim of creating a, a nervous system for the world, monitoring the state of the seas, uh, rainforests, and so on, and in theory, combining a sensing layer, an analytics layer, a decision layer on forest, food, water, energy, and so on. Very ambitious project, ran out of money, interestingly, didn't quite solve the problems of economics and governance and so on, but was a a pointer to a genuine assembly linked into dozens of universities around the world. Uh, and that's the NASA forward plan, where apparently by 2035 we have an integrated Earth observing system, simulations, global mitigation and adaptation. Not sure how real any of that is, but it's a, it's a nice vision of a collective intelligence assembly. The more recent one is Copernicus. Have any of you heard of Copernicus? So this is Europe's attempt at something like planetary skin, which again is an assembly combining observation of marine, land, atmosphere, climate, tying into large-scale an an analytics, predictive models, etc., and in theory feeding back into the people acting on that to manage uh, fishing resources, etc. Unlike planetary skin, it's kind of solved the money problem. It's got a 7 billion euro budget. Uh, like Planetary skin, though, it's relatively strong on the data and analytics and very weak on the feed into action and decision-making on the ground. The next example is AMI, uh, AI for Medical um, Epidemics, which is a very interesting, quite recent organisation trying to do a collective intelligence assembly for disease outbreaks. And AMI um, has been trialled in various areas, including in, in Malaysia, and around the Rio Olympics to have a better way of spotting outbreaks of things like uh, dengue, Ebola, and so on, to have predictive algorithms to predict how the uh, infection is likely to spread, and then to work with local public health systems to try and contain them. They claim quite high um, accuracy, 86.37% at the moment, and um, a, a very rapidly evolving set of tools, including um, using lessons from Pokemon Go about how to incentivize the public to spot infections and become part of the reporting system for uh, Amy. And in February, started launching their AI-driven mobile app for predicting dengue uh, outbreaks. So that's, that's an example beginning to be a bit more like the picture of assembly uh, I described. Metasub is another one. Uh, New York-based um, metagenomics and meta-design of subways and urban biomes, which basically means the genetic makeup of the bacteria on the subway. And this is part of the global battle against antimicrobial resistance, which threatens to kill tens of millions of people if we don't solve it. And their approach is to take swabs on subways, like the New York subway, um, to analyse their genetic makeup, and they give us these things called pathomaps, um, where are we? About here at the moment. Um, and this shows that on the New York subway, there's quite a lot of plagues, um, you know, so be careful what you touch when you go home. Um, and the, the idea is, and across now 77 cities of the world, they are mapping the very different genetic makeup of bacteria, working with public health systems in order to enable the world to respond much more quickly if resistant bacteria take hold in large cities and start spreading. So, again, this is part of something closer to a global collective intelligence. I think they still have challenges with the link into action and feedback and really connecting to the millions of public health workers around the world, but it's a good, good attempt. 
And then the one I'm most closely involved in is this one with the most boring name you can imagine, the English National Cancer Registration Service, but which I think is actually quite a, a, an impressive attempt at a collective intelligence assembly going several stages beyond other ones. So this pulls in a huge range of data sources from, um, uh, from screenings, from health records, etc., uh, at primary and secondary care, uh, tracking diagnosis, treatment, etc., into a single intelligent uh, system. It has um, each year about 360,000 people come into the system from a new cancer diagnosis, and as you can see, about 17 million prescriptions and a rapid growth both in the number of different feeds from labs, screening units, but also of um, uh, numbers of different data fields. And that is then feeding into a system, which means every doctor can see the entire picture of all of the, um, say, the, the diagnosis, the screenings, etc. Uh, the patient gets the same. What is possibly unusual about this is it is also beginning to link into commercial socioeconomic data to predict which families are most at risk of getting into debt because of a cancer, so they can be given debt support and financial support. It's linking to the genomics database of Genomics England, which has 100,000 full genome sequences on it, uh, and it gives um, the patient predictive algorithms on likely survival rates with different uh, treatment paths, and is an attempt, as I say, at a comprehensive collective intelligence assembly for a particular field, in this case, um, cancer. Uh, again, it's, some of its weaknesses are on the link into behavior. It's quite well designed for doctors and nurses. It isn't yet very well designed for typical patient, cognitive styles, etc. And that's one of the things we're working on at the moment. How does it become uh, more linked into both patient and citizen generation of data and use of data in something more like a real assembly? So just two or three sort of final uh, examples, which are really works in progress. So the first is about jobs, and we're currently in the, in the next six months trying to build an equivalent collective intelligence assembly for a labor market. How can you make the labor market of the city of Brooklyn or New York more like those things for the environment and public health? And what we're putting together is a few, few building blocks. The first one was done about a year ago, which used a whole series of data sets from a school, national pupil database, and labor market data to give teenagers data-driven guidance on what subjects to choose at 14 or 15 in the light of likely job outcomes, pay levels, and happiness levels in different jobs. So that's one bit of an assembly aimed at young people. We've then been developing a, a, a skilled profiler which web scrapes all of job adverts across the whole country to look at what employers are looking for in terms of skills, what pay levels are, so that you can put in your own um, skills and occupation and work out what your options are in the labour market. And that goes live as a beta form. Well, it is live, but published in, a, in about a week's time. That gets to detail on things like what skills employers are looking for. So this is actuaries, economists, and statisticians looking at the balance of things like communication skills, statistics, uh, maths teaching, and so on. And again, you can click down into much more granular detail. And then we've been working with Pearson and Oxford University on a forecast of likely job patterns in 2030, a project which builds on what Mike Osborne did four years ago, looking at the US and UK, which came up with a very widely publicized figure of 48% of US jobs likely to disappear by 2030. He's part of this team, and the new forecast is very different, and I'm not allowed to tell you what it is. Um, and this helps us break down the skills components of hundreds of jobs to make some predictions about likely job needs but also what should schools be doing now to prepare young people for the likely labor market of 2030. And we can, it's a combination of data-driven machine learning to generate categories, but also expert panels interrogating the data from the machine learning in an interaction to try to come to a more meaningful prediction. And these are the sort of skills, perhaps, obviously, we're seeing right in the jobs 
fields which are rising, like fluency of ideas, creativity, systems evaluation. But this will be a huge body of detail, if you're interested, coming out shortly. And it, it gives us things like um, you know, looking at the tech intensity of occupations um, and look at the different software uh, programs needed in different occupations. There is so much data out there now in modern labour markets, very little of which is brought together in a comprehensive, integrated way to be useful for citizens. And we already have live here a version of this, again, a tool for understanding things like digital tech occupations, creative occupations, what's happening to pay, what's going up, what's going down, and so on. But the idea is to assemble these into a semi-integrated system of observation, models, predictions, uh, memory, and the ability of people then to use this to make intelligent judgments in real time. The one other example I want to give is from Taiwan. Uh, a few months ago, we published an overview of uh, democratic, digital democratic experiments around the world, partly based on what we had been doing in Spain, uh, Finland, and Iceland. And in a way, this is, I think, the closest to democracy as assembly, in my meaning of assembly rather than the classic meaning of assembly. Uh, and this is the V Taiwan. Um, uh, initiative around the parliament in Taiwan, set up by Audrey Tang, who was a hacker and is now digital minister. And this is an attempt to develop a new way for congresses, parliaments to, to govern, which goes through a series of stages where stage one is about getting the facts, agreeing uh, in common, online and offline, using a Wikipedia timeline, what are the facts behind an issue, and the ministries have to publish what they think the facts are. There's also an open process for people to contribute their own. There's then a stage tapping into emotions and feelings around the issue, uh, which uses POLIS, the Washington-based um, AI uh, system. Uh, then a whole set of processes for making sense of the facts and the emotions before moving to decision by parliament and government, a combination of face-to-face -face and online. Now, it remains unclear how much this can work. It was first used for Uber regulation. But it's, it's a, a good example, I think, of trying to see democratic innovation not as a single thing, you know, everyone clicks like or don't like, but as an assembly of elements. And all real democracy is, in fact, an assembly of multiple elements, elections, parties, parliaments, manifestos, media, etc. And we've learnt over... A long period of history, democracy shouldn't be thought of as one person, one vote. Democracy works as a complex ecology of interlocking uh, elements. And Taiwan is using that mindset to reinvent democracy in practice. So I hope I've sort of made clear what, what I think is the, the possibility of moving beyond discrete projects just for perhaps observation or predictions into something more like a system of collective intelligence, which can therefore think and ideally have some capacity for second, first, second and third loop learning. This is not obvious, and in the cancer case, they're quite good at second loop learning, recognising when a phenomenon, a cancer phenomenon, does not fit the existing categories, but really struggle with third loop learning, trying to generate new cognitive models to cope with um, things like the effects of environments on cancers, which generally the medical profession struggles with. What I want to end on is sort of what the problem is with all of this. So problem number one um, is the one we need economists to help with. Who pays for things like this? Whose job is it to generate a financial base for a global collective intelligence assembly? In the case of... Um, uh, the environment, Copernicus, is now being funded by the European Commission, which is a rich body. But Planetary Skin and HP Sense, another version, showed how hard it is to do this without a very strong um, funding base. The cancer example works in the UK because it's part of a, a national health service, uh, which is spending six or probably about $10 billion a year on cancer. So the relatively small cost of this it is essentially lost in the mix. 
But for all the other fields, it's not at all clear who would pay, what is the economic base of digital commons in general in this new era. They certainly don't fit the business models of advertising, search-driven, Googles, Facebooks, etc. But most public bodies have lost the confidence or the will to finance these sort of things. And economics has been hopeless in generating new theories of the finance of digital commons, which are becoming so important in our lives. Next, what are the skills needed to do these things well? We've, in a couple of weeks, we'll publish a, a paper with case studies and all the things I've described. And in interviewing the people involved in them, they tell a story really of improvisation, of putting these together, but they didn't know where to turn for guidance on how to do these well. There is no craft profession yet for collective intelligence assembly, I think, though maybe someone in this room will tell me otherwise. And related to that, where are the centres of expertise for really doing this well? And this is where somewhere like an NYU is incredibly well placed to be such a centre of expertise. It has to be cross-disciplinary. It has to link the computer science, um, the information, data science, web science, but also psychology, behavioural understanding, culture, politics, economics. Otherwise, these simply won't work. And so my final sort of thought, really, for this conference is whether one way of thinking about where AI plus CI goes next is in terms of a field we could call intelligence design. Now, this isn't intelligent design, which is, of course, God um, doing everything, but nor is it the assumption that intelligence and collective intelligence emerge organically without any effort, which was a bit of the sort of mythology of 10, 20, 30 years ago, that just networks naturally solve these problems. I think we've learned again and again that's a very naive view, that they do need some structure, some funding, some base, some dedication of, uh, of resources. And I think that really the question for this field is how are we going to build the expertise, the skill, the practical knowledge of intelligence design, and then to apply it to issues like youth unemployment, uh, community violence, refugee integration, all the way through to issues like cancer and climate change, and demonstrate how all the ideas we collectively are working on can really be useful to the world and not just interesting and fun, because at the moment there is still far more money and far more energy going into intelligent tools for killing people, or as Jeff Hammerbacker put it, you know, the best brains of his generation this is Facebook's head of data, basically focusing on how to get people to click through onto adverts. And I think we can do better than that. Thank you. So, Jeff, why don't we... Um, let me, we get on the roving mic. Can you so that you are here. So why don't, if you uh, have a comment or a question, you put up your hand, I'm going to, uh, so, and while Henry's getting to you, I want to ask you a quick question, um, which is some of the, th what you've, you've shown us an incredible series of examples. You've written about projects that are impressive. The question is, how do we sustain them? Mm. So some of the things mm. you uh, illustrated for us here in terms of field building, in terms of investment, are obviously part of that. Mm. I'm wondering if you can tell us something just about why so many of these projects have failed over time. Is that OK? Do they need to last forever? Or are there ingredients that we can put in place to essentially build the infrastructure to sustain collective intelligence as a mode of operating? Well, I, th I think they do need to be sustained, and I think without some cum cumulative learning, whether it is just gathering large data sets which go back over long periods of time, the machines don't learn, and uh, I'm struck in how many fields memory is essentially lost, and people reinvent the wheel again and again unnecessarily because there are no institutions with the job of synthesizing knowledge. In terms of the economics of sustainability, it's in some ways a, a depressing story, um, the examples which have worked best that I know are ones where, in some ways, quite old-fashioned tax-raising governments simply fund these things. So we have these What Works centres now in the UK who organise the memory of the teaching field, healthcare, policing. They're funded out of taxpayers' money. No one came up with an alternative uh, to doing that. Copernicus is tax-funded. 
Cancer registration is tax funded. In an ideal world, and this is where we need economic creativity, some of the global informational commons would be used to finance the collective intelligence assemblies. So things like geostationary orbits. You know, why are we not taxing geostationary orbits for satellites to fund things like Copernicus and planetary skin? Why don't we use the value of electromagnetic spectrum as a tax base for collective intelligence? The dominance of a particular, essentially VC-funded business model from Silicon Valley meant that the whole imagination of a generation of digital pioneers forgot about the need for economic imagination and com uh, funding commons as commons. Google Maps, in a way, is the exception which proves the rule, which only works because of its integration to the other elements of, of Google in terms of generating value. And I'd love to hear other people's answers about what, you know, thinking 10, 20, 30 years into the future, what is a plausible long-run economic base for these sort of things, which potentially generate so much value to a, a global system. you know, 20 million people submitting slips to, the, to write the, uh, mm. the Oxford English Dictionary. Mm. Are there projects that work better or don't work? Do, is there some typology that you can give us of what's going to be more sustainable in terms of things, problems that lend themselves better? Oh, uh, yeah, so, um, well, Beth is mentioned, in, in, in the book I use as one of the first examples of uh, collective intelligence. Well, the one of the first is actually Thucydides on um, the siege of a, of a, of a city uh, more than 2,000 years ago. But in the modern era, the Oxford English Dictionary was one of the first examples of, uh, a bit like Google Maps, of trying to map the entire language, the meaning and history of every single word, and developed a method for doing that which involved tens of thousands of volunteers working in a highly structured way dealing with bits of a letter and gathering vast quantities of, um, uh, of sources and then combining it into a single system. It's almost identical to Wikipedia. If you read the Oxford English Dictionary story, it's clear you know, there's almost nothing different in Wikipedia other than that it was done uh, online. And there are quite a lot of examples of, like that where there are very well-defined problems, very easily uh, defined sort of categories, and, um, and commensurability of the types of knowledge. And for those, I think we've got fairly mature systems now for organising collective intelligence at large scale. The ones which we're struggling with are ones where the goal is, is fuzzy, unclear, where there's deeply conflicting interests, and there's a whole chunk of theory for another day on collective intelligence in conditions of conflict, deep conflict of either values uh, or interests, and problems where you have to go through the second or third loop in order to get to the right question rather than the right answer. And um, on Monday, we had a gathering of a lot of the world's innovation labs. There are many of these labs in national and city governments around the world trying to solve complex problems using different tools. And it's interesting, whenever that group comes together, they all reflect that they, things work best when they spend much more time defining the problem rather than jumping straight into solutions. And yet all the pressures of their bosses, the ministers and mayors and so on, is to get very, very quickly into uh, solutions. Uh, and usually when that happens, they actually solve the wrong problem. And so having the space for sort of second and third loop learning so you can really iterate, really interrogate the right question is still the hardest thing, I think, for us to do on, on complex problems. So, Jeff, uh, I had a related question, which is, on your list of the building blocks of collective intelligence, mm. there was nothing in there about what the utility function of the collective intelligence is or what the goals or, mm. or values of mm. this. So, how do you think about that? Well, <clears throat> there's, a whole, there's a whole literature on how should you uh, measure or define uh, intelligence, which is deeply problematic. You know, for an individual, how do you measure 
Do you measure IQ, i.e. the efficiency of certain functions, or do you measure people's ability to live a good life or be happy or to generate good goals and reach their goals? So it's a I think it's a very complex issue, which I've deliberately left out of that, because you could do all the things I described for values utterly different from mine. In a way, um, it's, a sort of, it's, it's a parallel but secondary issue what, what values are infused in any collective intelligence system. And you know, the other probably two best examples I would have given would have been Amazon. So in many ways, Amazon now has a fantastically sophisticated collective intelligence assembly uh, from its gathering of data, its ABCDEF uh, testing, its predictive tools for warehouse delivery, its you know, scanning of Kindle words. All these things are pulled together. But what are the values underpinning that? You know, Amazon is not known as a very values-driven organization. It's fantastically efficient, but not values-driven. Or uh, some of the world's military uh, systems, again, are quite close to what I've described in linking observation, prediction, memory, etc., and indeed creativity, but often with values you might or might not share. So, um, yeah, it's the essential, so secondary question is what for? What, what ends linked to these means? And uh, there's a whole chunk of my book goes into all of that and the questions about consciousness and evolution of consciousness, but that's probably one for another day, I think. Unless you've got a really good short answer to your own question. <laughs> Or, or examples. I mean, I, I've sort of tried to throw a question to you all about where are the best live examples either of centres of expertise or of assemblies which we should be looking at as, as inspiring case studies. Hi, uh, my name is Ian Miller. I'm from the University of Toronto. Um, kind of related to the previous comment and questions, I've been thinking um, lately about the ethics of collective intelligence and I've seen a little bit of discussion about the idea of a digital Geneva Convention in the context of information warfare and militaries. Mm -hmm. And I've been coming to wonder, um, is our optimism in collective intelligence justified and how much farther can we push before we need to confront the ethics of collective intelligence to prevent a negative outcome? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think I see this as an arms race. So one of the um, chunks of the book is all about the enemies of collective intelligence. And there's a lot of them. Uh, I mean, there are obviously all the, um, the hacks, the trolls, the viruses, etc. There are the interest deliberately obfuscating information or issues or fake news, you name it. In almost any real life situation, there's a lot of powerful forces trying to um, disrupt everything I've described. Now, the implication of that actually is that the world needs to build much stronger immune systems to combat those enemies, uh, and that will probably require significant investment, not just in classics of cybersecurity hardware and software, but also actually in roles, which are un almost certainly underinvested in uh, at the moment in terms of the protective uh, uh, systems. Um, quite a few of the institutions I mentioned in passing are possible new institutions to play that role, whether at a national level uh, or, or a global level. We may need new laws as well. Um, you know, what, how do we treat not just the ethics, but the legality of actions which seriously uh, corrupt the collective intelligence of a system on which other people's lives depend? I think that will come into, uh, into sight uh, fairly, fairly quickly. Um, almost all of those concepts, though, are quite challenging for a sort of easygoing, libertarian sort of worldview of much of the digital space, which I think believed 10 or 20 years ago that these things were dealt with automatically, that somehow the organic wisdom of the network and the crowd would essentially sort those things out. I think anyone really believes that now. I don't think they do anyway. Yet we haven't done the serious work on designing, as I say, the immune system uh, of the future. And just one little example, I mentioned very quickly in passing the work which my colleague Juan Mateus Garcia has done on the economics of algorithmic decision making and human supervision, which is quite surprising in a way. And he, he looks at um, yeah, the, the, 
the economics of, let's say, an algorithm deciding on a recommendation for YouTube searches or a driverless car or a surgical procedure, in some of those cases, like you know, the YouTube search or a Google um, search, the cost of error is very low. It really doesn't matter if it gives you lots of completely meaningless suggestions as to what to watch. Uh, in other cases, like the driverless car or surgery, the cost of error is hugely high. And his forecast is that the, for the firm, the economic logic will be to actually, that the more decisions are algorithmically based, the more human supervisors will have to be employed to screen out for those very few examples where an error comes from the algorithm and causes immense harm. And that's particularly true where environments change. So the training set for the algorithm becomes misleading. And that happens all the time because environments are very rarely stable. And so, yeah, his, his say, counterintuitive forecast is we are in an era when the number of human supervisors will mushroom exponentially, as, of course, has happened in China, where hundreds of thousands of people, you know, survey Weibo and so on for the state. Um, Facebook employed, what, 3,000 new people last month to be supervisors. Uh, and... Anyways, it's, one, it's part of the same story of thinking about collective intelligence and AI not just in a linear way as a good thing, but as creating new risks, new dangers and new enemies, which then need new countermeasures. Okay. Yes, please go. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, I'm Chuck Pozeski. I'm from Washington State University. And I'm a mechanical engineering professor working in this field. And... Um, I'm a big fan of Conway's Law, and Conway's Law says the design of a system will reflect the social structure that created it, okay? So what do you think, or let me, let me I, the question I want to know from your perspective is, so you're in charge of Nesty and all this stuff, so you have some level of ability to affect that social structure. So what, what do you think the optimal social structure for cl cr creating that collective intelligence thing that's going to make everybody happy in the future looks like? <laughs> that's a great question. I could spend the next 10 years trying to answer it. Uh, um, I have answers too, actually, but, but I'm really interested. I mean, it's not just a trick yeah, question here. Well, let, let me give the example of health care. I think health is where it's the most interesting and alive at the moment. Um, most of these systems are designed by, by doctors, actually. The cancer system by by progressive, technology-oriented doctors who get a foothold within the system, within you know, Kaiser Permanente or our health services, and just sort of do it. And as a result, exactly following Conway's law, the kind of structure of power and knowledge does somewhat reflect you know, the existing hierarchies. of Exactly. Um, the alternative approach is beginning to happen in some um, disease groups, uh, and it, we, we, we hosted a gathering last month in London of about 500 people, quite a lot from the US, who are working on patient organizations uh, around um, either rare diseases or brain diseases or genetic disorders who come together to try and design essentially a collective intelligence assembly for themselves, where they may be pooling data. We run, for example, in the UK, a thing called Dementia Citizens, which gets people with dementia to share real-time data and run research experiments on themselves with control groups. That then feeds back into the wider, wider health system. They're becoming much more able as advocates to influence the neighboring system. So Sharon Terry, for example, from here, is one of the, the pioneers of doing that. Patients like me, patients know best. A whole bunch of organizations bringing together often hundreds of thousands of patients to be part of the co-design and co-creation of the system, again to counter that tendency towards both hierarchy and fragmentation. Um, it's a field in motion, very rapid motion. Um, I think it's ahead of other fields because the stakes are so high for people with a rare disease and because it being healthcare, there's a lot of money. But the traditional health funders have really struggled to engage with this. The big money organizations still have a much more traditional, top-down knowledge creation. And the thing, the thing which has really opened this up, I think, is failure. So dementia is a great example where you here in this country have spent, I can't remember how many billion dollars on dementia, pharmaceutical innovation, to essentially no progress at all. 
So complete failure of other systems then opens up space. Um, health is also one which has a lot of money and a lot of collective intelligence problems. So here I think it's called for a million Americans die each year from medical error in hospitals. Of the world's 30,000 diseases, only a quarter have any known treatment at the moment. And of those treatments, the average efficacy is about 20%. So this whole system, which we often look to as being amazingly intelligent, actually, when you look closely, is pretty riddled with failures. So that's where we're betting our money, as it were, it will also be the place where we see the biggest breakthroughs in new forms of collective intelligence and assembly, which then can be applied in other fields. Well, no, they're doing that, not, not we. Yeah. So I think we have time for one yeah. more quick question, and yeah. the mic is already in your hands. Yeah. yeah, asking for your thoughts on use of collective intelligence concepts and methods towards evolving good governance systems. You touched, you made a brief remark about democracy as, as an ecology. It's a question of arriving at a good design and possible methods of moving towards it. Sorry, so good design for... for for good governance systems. No, what would it look like, a good governance system? Yeah, so how can one use say, collective intelligence concepts and yeah. methods in saying that what do we try for and how do we move towards it? Yeah. Well, I mean, Beth is the expert on this, so you should answer the question. Um, I mean, in a modest way, it's what we've been trying to do with European cities like Barcelona, Madrid, and Helsinki with the tools I showed briefly. And in a way, those then become part of the, the nervous system of the, the city. At their simplest, they mean that whenever the city is making a decision on any topic, people who are interested can know that's happening. If that decision needs some kind of expertise, they can tap into a community of expertise to help guide the decision, both online and offline. If the decision requires citizen input to the decision itself, there are ways for citizens to propose ideas, to comment, to deliberate, and particularly with tools which freeze out the kind of trolling, adversarial, dumbing down social media democracy processes. So the, the Icelandic examples are, I think, the best for, um, for, for, for doing that. Um, and the aim is then the representatives, you know, the mayor, the people in the council, they still have the power, but it's a constant dialogue with the intelligence of the city as decisions are made. And that, to my mind, is closer to an ideal of collective intelligence. It means that the governing system amplifies the intelligence of the society rather than dumbing it down. And you can sort of see that when it happens. And, you know, there are many... Paris is the other, I think, quite interesting example, which now has you know, over 100 million euro each year in a participatory budgeting <coughs> pot, is divided by neighbourhoods, and there's also, I think, 10 million for school kids to make decisions on allocation. So from an early age, you're then learning to be an active, intelligent citizen in your city, not just an angry observer, you know, listening to shock jocks and um, complaining every now and again. <laughs>